The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good afternoon, everyone out here on the East Coast, and good morning to everybody else throughout the rest of the country. Thanks for joining us today um, as another webinar in our webinar series uh, this spring. So with that being said, before we get started, um, again, we are living in some unprecedented times now for our country, for the world, and, and for our industry. Um, but as always, you know, know that we here at Rainbow and Rainbow Scientific are, are here, we're operating, we're doing everything we can to continue to provide support and training um, to the industry on tree and shrub healthcare. So please feel free to continue to reach out to us and, and we'll do our best to maintain what we've always done here. Also know, a quick commercial, that we still have some more webinars coming up. We have a good host of webinars coming up. Um, we've also had a few webinars already, so you can go to our website, treecarescience.com, or find us on YouTube to find some of the past webinars we've done already this spring, as well as um, older webinars. Um, and then we have a lot of great webinars coming up around Emerald Ash Borer. We have a great one coming up just tomorrow at this time on Emerald Ash Borer. Um, we have several coming up next week on Emerald Ash Borer and then specific California pests. Um, and then again, um, some other neat things that are going to be coming around around plant health care and management. Uh, the one on April 30th is going to be a, a, a really nice webinar. It's going to be more of a training webinar. So if you have new folks that are new to um, spraying or plant health care, this is going to be going over um, proper mixing and application techniques for spraying. So that's a neat one. Again, if you have some, some new folks that you're onboarding, um, that would be a neat one form to go ahead and watch. Uh, and if there's any other things that you guys would like to know about, um, any other virtual trainings or topics, um, please feel free to reach out to your local territory manager or arborologist and you can always email us at info at treecarescience.com. Just a little bit more housekeeping here. One is we always like to start our um, meetings with some kind of a safety assessment. So please take a note of your surroundings. Um, Make sure you're aware of any potential hazards, tripping hazards, cords, things of that nature. Uh, hopefully you're not driving and listening to this. Uh, if you are, hope that you're pulled over and in a safe place. Um, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to put them in the question box. So over on the right hand side of your screen, you have this little kind of rectangle with this little tiny arrow. If you click on that arrow, that will bring out this entire dialogue box. There you have a place for questions. So please feel free to type your questions in there and we will get to those at the conclusion of the uh, slide presentation. Um, with me today, as always, is uh, Matt Karst uh, and he'll be aiding with um, answering questions, uh, reading questions at the end. And again, this webinar is gonna be recorded and emailed out to you. Um, and so again, when we put these webinars together, uh, we put them together pretty quickly. Um, so we were unable to get pre-approved for ISA CEUs and, I, excuse me, International Society of Arboriculture CEUs. So if you are an ISA certified arborist, you can go through a, a post-approval credit form. Um, more information on that will be emailed to you at the conclusion of this webinar. Um, it's pretty easy, pretty straightforward process, um, but just know that you are not pre-approved. You'll have to do self-reporting. Uh, again, a few more steps, pretty easy though. Um, shouldn't be shouldn't be an issue. Any questions? Again, you can reach out to us, and we'll walk you through that process. Um, so again, my name is Patrick Anderson. There's a photograph of me if you're wondering uh, where this voice is coming from. I'm an arborologist here with Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements. I live in North Carolina uh, in the Greater Charlotte Metro area. So with all that, let's get started with what we're talking about today, which is managing scale insects in commercial landscapes. Uh, the hidden enhancement surface. Um, so it's a little bit of a play on words and we'll learn why that's a play on words here in a little while. Um, real quick though, of course, know that everything we present to you today is based in silence, in science. Um, so again, as an example, our commitment to research, uh, last year we did about 150 field research trials. And we do that in partnership, not only um, with other companies, but as well as research institutions. So know that when we bring these protocols to you, they are backed in science uh, and they're backed in replicated um, trial research. So we are very confident in the information that we are bringing to you today. Um, and again, 
part of our commitment is to work with folks and uh, on training and field support. So, you know, right now, again, a little different, unprecedented time. We're not going to be meeting people in the field um, like we usually would, but we are uh, geared up to do virtual trainings. We also have application guides. Um, we have all kinds of resources to help everyone be successful with applications in the field. And we also have our full time tech support line and team. So during normal business hours, of course, you can give us a call. Uh, you can talk to a live tech support person and we'll help you again with diagnostics, um, answering questions about rates, products, things like that. Um, as I mentioned, we have a whole host of resources that we have uh, we can provide, whether it be diagnostic guides, opportunity guides, application guides, um, and then more in-depth uh, management guides. These are all the things that we provide. Um, and of course, we have a whole host of uh, tree and shrub care products that we provide as well. Uh, you can find these on our website. You can download our uh, 2020 catalog as well. So with all that, let's get into what we're actually going to be talking about today, which is scales and scale management. So our, our objective today are to talk about scales. So we're going to learn what are scale insects. We're going to talk about their impact on the landscape. We're going to talk about common scale insects that we find on commercial landscapes. Um, and then we're going to talk about treatment protocols. And then we're going to talk about next steps or how we can actually get into action on managing scales in the landscape. So as a real quick, um, just to kind of get it out, when we first put this, um, this presentation together, the intent was that we would kind of focus on um, common scale insects in kind of the, the southeastern portion of the United States. So the mid-Atlantic states, southeastern states, and Texas. Uh, but looking at the registration counts, it looks like we have some folks that are um, very well represented throughout the entire country. So put in a few more um, insects outside of what we were originally going to cover. Uh, so hopefully this will still be very applicable to, uh, to everybody on the line today. Uh, and of course, if you have any other questions, you can put in the question box, reach out to us later. So with that being said, if you've never heard of scales, what the heck are scale insects? Well, they are animals and they are insects. Uh, if we kind of go down more of the Linnaean chart here, they're in the order Hematera. And so they are in the kind of same order as a lot of other insects that we're probably familiar with. Things like leafhoppers, aphids, cicadas, adelgids, and whiteflies. So these are insects that we're probably all fairly, fairly um, uh, familiar with. Uh, but then of course they fall into their own super order and super family. Um, so again, that order, what is distinguishing that order, these are what we consider the majority of our piercing and sucking insects. So that's the one distinction with this group of, of insects and scales is that they have piercing and sucking mouth parts. Um, now, if we get a little bit narrowed down to not just this whole order, but scales specifically, the thing that makes scales so unique is that the adult females, when again, this is when they're adults, they usually lack wings, legs, or segmentation. So if you look in an adult scale insect, it's basically just like a juicy blob with a mouth part that feeds on plants. Um, really curious insect, and we'll talk more about that here in a second, of course, but a really just interesting insect to be managing. Um, there are about 30 or so scale families. And of course the taxonomists like to move, uh, you know, especially insects and fungi around all the time. Uh, but again, high level, about 30 families. So scales play an important role in the ecosystem. Uh, one of their biggest things is they, they serve as a food source for a lot of other arthropods, both themselves as, as like an animal. So like other animals will eat scales, um, but some scales produce a sugary substance called honeydew, which we'll talk about more. And things like ants will actually farm these scales and harvest that sugary substance, that honeydew, which is pretty unique. Uh, and here we have an example of some kind of ant. And here we have a Kermie scale is down in Texas. Um, and what it's trying to do is, is harvest some of the sugary substance that that scale is creating. Now, human beings have been using scales actually for a long period of time. So for thousands of years, um, humans have used certain species of scales specifically uh, for dyes. So again, folks in the, um, the 15th through even modern times, 15th centuries or modern times have used scale insects 
um, to create dyes and things like that. We also use them in cosmetics and historically use them in cosmetics and foods. And I'm not sure if some of you folks remember, but way back in 2012, Starbucks was going to be using this uh, specific scale insect that grows on prickly pear. Uh, it was going to use its dye, and that's an example of that insect, scale insect, and that's an example of when you squish it, it makes that nice, beautiful red substance there. Uh, Starbucks was going to use that in one of their drinks, and, and people pushed back on that. People didn't want um, bug juice as a dye in their drinks. Uh, but again, scales have been around. We use them all the time. But why are they, you know, the context today, of course, is scale insects damaging plants. So, you know, why are we worried about scales on plants? Well, of course, they're feeding on plants. Uh, so they can reduce the aesthetic appeal. Um, they can cause chlorosis. Uh, some scale insects can produce, as we mentioned, that honeydew, which then sooty mold can grow on. Uh, they can decrease photosynthetic, photosynthetic activity. Um, they can transmit different types of viruses. And of course, they can represent economic losses through reduction in quantity, or quantity quality, and, and aesthetics, things like that. Now, what about on property? So if we look now here at a typical commercial property here, um, you know, and we notice we have a lot of trees here. A lot of trees here look green. Again, this is early spring. We have a lot of trees and leaf, a lot of trees looking green. And we have this one lone red maple that just doesn't look good. And there's a lot of reasons why this might not be looking good. And it might be more than one reason, but one reason certainly why this plant's not looking good is if we get closer to it, we notice that it is just covered in this uh, scale insect. This in particular is gloomy scale. So this is where the play on words comes in, the hidden enhancement service, is because these are very difficult to identify from far away. Again, looking back here, we can't see nothing is is jumping out on us. We don't see anything huge. And even when we get a little bit closer, we don't see anything huge. It's when we actually start getting really close to the plant that we can see all these black bumps here, these are all representative of individual insects feeding on the cells of this tree. So you can see when we get these scale insects, even though they're minute, small, millimeters wide, um, when you get them in large numbers, they can start very much damaging the tree and being added stress to the tree. Uh, another example here, so here's some crepe myrtle. This is in South Carolina. You know, again, we, this isn't gonna be too interactive, but you know, if I'm looking at this plant here and I'm looking at this plant here, which one would I rather have? You know, this one is kind of yellow and thin. This one is green and full. Well, obviously I'd rather have this plant. So what's going on with this plant? Well, again, if we look closer at it, it is covered in crepe myrtle bark scale. And so again, crepe myrtle bark scale, again, dozens, hundreds of insects individually feeding on this plant, reducing its aesthetic appeal and uh, vitality there. The other thing we can have issues with is not just plant health, but also aesthetics on a property. So here, perfect example, this is, uh, in this case here, cottony camellia scale, another kind of um, soft scale insect producing a lot of honeydew and sooty mold. So here we have sooty mold all over this holly in this case. So again, reducing that um, aesthetic appeal. In this case here, also inter, uh, interrupting photosynthetic capacity because of course you have a bunch of black mold growing over the green parts of the plant that would be absorbing sunlight. So another great picture. So here we have another crepe myrtle and this crepe myrtle, we not zoomed in on it, but it's affected by crepe myrtle bark scale again. And notice this fancy Volvo, and I probably should have blocked out that license plate. That's my bad to this person. Um, but again, notice this fancy Volvo parked underneath it. And notice that it's covered in some kind of gross substance. And if we zoom in again, this is all just this, um, in this case here, this car must have been uh, parked here for some time. It is just caked in sooty mold, which again is a result of the honeydew that is a result of the feeding of the um, crepe myrtle bark scale there. So again, you can see why you know managing scales on properties can be a, a very important um, aspect to managing a property as a whole. So reduces plant vitality, reduces plant aesthetics, can over time lead to plant death, um, but also can be just a nuisance issue for the inhabitants of that community um, through things like that sooty mold and honeydew just raining down on them. And that's the other thing I failed to mention is in high populations, again, if you go back to this picture here, um, 
if you walked underneath that plant, it would feel like a light mist was was raining down on you. And of course, it's a, a light mist of insect excrement. Um, so something to, again, continue to think of. Now, going back to what scales are and why they are in, and what scales are important. So in the grand scheme of things, as we mentioned, there's about 30 families of scales. And most of these are just pretty much innocuous. They're, they're not bugging us. They're not bugging plants. They're just out there and bear the pun bugging, right? Because they're a type of bug. Um, they're just out there. Uh, for us, there's really, there's four families of scale insects that um, bother us. And there's going to be three that we're covering here today. So the four families would include soft scales. So this is an example here of a soft scale, armored scales, uh, and then the felty scales. And we'll talk about the difference between these three different uh, insects here um, in a little while. And then also we have mealybugs. Um, mealybugs, most of the time we find them affecting um, different types of shrub material. Uh, and usually most of our mealybug issues are in subtropical kind of environments. So places like Southern California, Southern Texas, um, and in and around the, the Gulf states, uh, you know, along the coast in Florida is where we usually have mealybug problems. Um, so let's talk about the difference between these types of insects. So we'll start with soft scales. So in general, and we're talking about adults here, adult soft scales are up to a quarter of an inch um, large, maybe smaller. Um, but generally, when we talk about scale insects, soft scale insects are a little bit larger than our other scale insects. So up to a quarter of an inch uh, large. Um, they often uh, have a smooth or cottony covering. Um, so here's an example. This is Lacanium scale. This is on a nuttle oak. This is actually in uh, Kansas. Uh, and you can see it has this kind of very smooth looking um, covering over it. Uh, they're often round or oval. Uh, so again, you see this round looking scale here. Um, and in the case of soft scales, they actually feed on the phloem. So they actually feed, passively feed in the phloem on sap. So uh, the photosynthates and things like that that the plant is creating and then sending it down through that phloem tissue, that's where those insects are feeding. So directly in that vascular system. That's important. We'll talk about that in a second here as well. Um, because they're passively feeding in that area, they create a lot of that sticky honeydew, which then, of course, causes sooty mold. Um, they can lay hundreds of thousands of eggs. Uh, they generally have one generation a year, generally speaking. Um, and most of the time they overwinter as um, nymphs here. Um, so that's a soft scale. Now here's a distinction. Uh, this is our probably our biggest distinction uh, with soft scales. And I'll also say that the felty scales, so remember we talked about we're gonna talk, we're gonna discuss three different types of scale insects, the armor scales, the soft scales, and the felty scales. Soft scales and felty scales feed very much the same way, um, and they behave very much the same way, and, and in many instances. So here we have the slide heading of soft scale, but think of also as the felty scales, we'll be doing the same thing. So what will happen is that scale insect will hatch from its egg, it will then crawl out, it will find a suitable feeding site, and this is when it will begin to feed. At this point, it will lose its legs uh, and antenna, um, and just kind of set here passively and feed in this vascular bundle. So these soft scales are feeding in this vascular bundle. And of course, what happens is they begin to create this honeydew. So again, soft scales are feeding on in that vascular bundle, creating honeydew. The honeydew then drips down and sooty mold um, begins to accumulate. So if you, from a diagnostic standpoint, if you are walking up to a tree, and you think it has some kind of scale insect, and you see sooty mold and honeydew, chances are you're dealing with a soft or felty scale. It's important to know when we talk about product choices. All right, so examples of soft scales throughout commercial landscapes. Um, so Lacanium scale, this is commonly found throughout the Southeast Texas and Mid-Atlantic, but you can find this throughout the rest of the country as well, as far up as to New England and things like that. So this is a soft scale insect that is very prevalent throughout at least the eastern part of the country. Um, so a typical life cycle is something like this. So it's going to overwinter as an instar. So it's going to actually overwinter as an immature insect, but at this point it's lost its its legs and its antenna and it's just kind of a oval blob on the plant 
So it's overwintering on these twigs. And this is very typical of a lot of our soft scales. In the early spring, it's gonna wake up, it's gonna start to feed, and then it's gonna mature into a female. So that female, and that's what we see here, these large scales, this is when people talk about scales, this is what they're often thinking of is these kind of, these armored coverings right here. That's our adult scale. So she's gonna sit there, she's gonna mature, she's gonna create this protective covering, she's gonna lay eggs, those the eggs that are eventually gonna hatch into this crawler phase. Now these crawlers, these are unprotected, they have um, legs and antennas, so these are actively moving, finding new feeding sites. Knowing when the crawler phase of, of a scale is super important because when we talk about management, we are targeting this crawler phase. Again, they are small, they are delicate, they're unprotected, they're very easy to kill. So when we talk about scale management, that's almost always wrapped around when those crawlers are gonna be active and begin to feed. And then, so from that standpoint, going back to our life cycle here, uh, these crawlers will find a new feeding spot. They will settle down, they will lose their legs and their antenna, and they will sit there until the fall, um, until they resettle someplace on a twig. And uh, again, that life cycle goes around. So really interesting life cycle. And again, interesting because those adults are basically just round blobs. And we'll look at a close-up of that here in a second. Uh, but lacanium scale, multiple host species, um, oaks, dogwoods, red buds, uh, but very common in commercial landscapes on oak trees. Um, and if you want to learn more about why that is, um, Dr. Steve Frank of NC State has done a lot of research on um, scale insects and hardscape. And so to make a long story short, when you have a lot of infrastructure, you have a lot of trapped heat, insects life cycles are kind of determined by heat. So the more heat you have, the more the insect will feed and grow, the more eggs it will lay, which means the more um, babies will, will have and just populations can explode. And that's why these certain of these uh, scale insects, that's why they're so important uh, on these commercial landscapes. All the ones we're discussing today, that's why they're so important is because um, they fit in that model of being able to grow uh, larger and produce more young when it's uh, warmer. So again, back here to Lacanium scale, crawlers will come out between 700 and 1600 growing degree days. Um, a phenological indicator would be when we see Catelpa begin to bloom. Another more common insect, scale insect, this is a felty scale, uh, is crepe myrtle bark scale. Um, this is spreading throughout the southeast at this point. It is found in Virginia, um, as far north as Virginia, I should say. Uh, we find it in North Carolina, South Carolina. Um, we find it throughout the Gulf states. And of course, it was introduced or first uh, discovered um, in the DFW area uh, of Texas back in 2004. Um, so relatively new introduction um, to the U.S., but certainly spreading. Its primary host is crepe myrtle. And again, if you live in the southeast of Texas and you parts of the Mid-Atlantic, you know how prevalent crepe myrtle is, especially on our commercial landscapes. A uh, very tough tree, very beautiful tree. Um, some might argue overplanted, um, but this is a, a huge issue here when we look at crepe myrtles on uh, crepe myrtle bark scale. Um, this is our primary host. They can also be found on American beautyberry as well as a few other host species, native host species, which is concerning. Um, but again, primarily crepe myrtle in our um, landscapes. This is an example of what a crawler looks like. So you can see they're very small. In this case with the uh, crepe myrtle bark scale, they're kind of purple. And you can see here the antenna on this one here, you can see its legs. Um, crepe myrtle bark scale can have up to four generations per season. So you can have multiple overlapping generations per season. Uh, they begin to emerge as these little crawlers early on in the spring. Um, in the Gulf states, they seem to peak somewhere between April and May. Some other common soft scale pests that we find throughout the country um, would be tulip tree scale. Uh, tulip tree scale can be found on tulip poplar and magnolia. This is an example of the adults on the twig. This is an example of nymphs and adults on the leaves. This is southern magnolia. And another big issue, soft scale issue, that we find in parts of the country, especially up north, uh, again, in, in the, the, I would say the New England and upper Midwest, is magnolia scale. 
So tulip tree scale and magnolia scale are very closely related. Uh, magnolia scale is actually the largest um, scale insect in the United States, in the North America. Uh, and you can see the damage in this case it does. It can really cause some significant damage to magnolias. And so here you can see, uh, in this case here, this feeding is causing these leaves to, to turn brown and uh, fall off. So these are some other ones to be aware of if you're in other parts of the country, for sure, soft scales to be looking out for. Uh, the unique thing with these um, is that with our other soft scales, notice that we talked about things happening in the spring. These happen later on, either in late summer or early fall, depending upon where you are in the country. So let's segue away from soft and um, felt scales onto armored scales, or hard scales, as some people might call them. Now, these are a little bit different. Um, so these are generally smaller. So again, generally speaking, we always speak in generalizations, um, our armored scales are going to be smaller, less than an eighth of an inch long, and they're often going to be elongate and kind of have this oyster shell looking appearance. This is Japanese maple scales, what we're looking at here in this photograph. Um, a distinction here is, too, is they form a waxy shell. So this protective covering, uh, it's called a test, if we want to get technical, that waxy covering um, is produced by armored scales. Now, with armored scales versus soft scales, if we were to take like a, a, a knife or a pen and we were to peel off that shell, that insect would stay attached to the, um, the tree. So with an armored scale, if we were to peel off its shell, its waxy coating that it produces, it would, the, the insect would stay on the tree. That's a distinction from soft scale. Soft scale, that protecting coating that it creates itself, it's more of like a skin and it's attached to the actual insect. So with a soft scale, if we were to peel that shell off, the insect would be inside that shell and come off with it, um, if that makes sense. So with armored scales, they form this waxy coating, this waxy shell that you could remove from the actual insect and see it on the tree still. Another key distinction here is that with armored scales, they do not produce honeydew. Um, so these guys are feeding actual on cell contents, not feeding in that sap or that phloem area. So we don't see honeydew or sooty mold associated with armored scales. Um, again, here we can find most life stages on the plant at the same time. Uh, these guys usually don't lay as many eggs, um, up to 100 or less. Uh, but here we have another distinction with armored scales versus soft scales is we often have multiple generations per year or we have a very extended crawler emergence period. So again, we mentioned before how important those crawlers are when we talk about management, um, targeting that first aim star, that first phase where they're walking around very delicate with their legs and antennae. Um, and in this case here, we can find these pests over winter as both nymphs and adults. So to look at our major distinction here with armor scales versus soft scales is where they feed. So recall that soft scale is feeding over here in this vascular bundle. Our armored scales are feeding in actual cell tissue. So because of that, our symptoms are different. So when we see early infestation of armored scale, we see chlorosis in the leaves. In this case here, this is camellia, and we have T-scale feeding on the other side of this leaf, causing this damage actually in cell content. So that's a big distinction there, um, is how they feed. And again, because they're not feeding in that vascular bundle, they're also, again, they're not going to create that honeydew. Now, if, if you folks take nothing away from this presentation then this one fact is that imidacloprid, we sell it as Zytec, imidacloprid is not effective on armored scales. Imidacloprid is very effective on soft scales, but if you're dealing with armored scales, imidacloprid or Zytec is how Rainbow sells it, will not be effective on your armored scales. And it comes into, again, where they're feeding. Imidacloprid moves up through the plant, and if in this vascular bundle. Now again, relatively speaking, imidacloprid is a pretty big molecule. Um, it has a higher uh, coefficient of adsorption. It does not move into these plant parts. So imidacloprid works very well 
at affecting soft scales feeding in this vascular bundle, but it doesn't really move outside of that vascular bundle, so it doesn't do much damage to insects feeding out here. This is a distinction with dinotefuron or transtech. Dinotefuron has, it's more water soluble, it's a smaller molecule, and it doesn't have such a high coefficient of absorption. So dinotefuron will make its way out into this area where these insects are feeding and be very effective. And of course, we'll show data here in just a few moments. But again, if you take nothing away, metacloprid is not effective on armored scales. Okay, so let's look at some common armored scales. Um, so again, one of our number one offenders of armored scales in the mid-Atlantic, down south, over through Texas, is going to be gloomy scale on red maple. So I would assert that just about every single red maple on a commercial property is going to have gloomy scale. Gloomy scale is often misidentified as a soft scale because it looks like you have a lot of sooty mold on this plant. But this isn't sooty mold. This is individual insects. So this is the black covering of individual insects. And again, with an armored scale, you can pop off that covering and find the insect underneath there. And so this is your female scale insect right there. Again, just a, a juicy bug bag feeding on the plant. So no legs, no eyes, no antenna, just a, a feed bag uh, feeding on that plant inside those individual cells. But then you can see her little babies here. So these are the scalers, crawlers, again, very small. Um, these are active. And again, if we're timing our treatments, we want to time treatments around managing these scroll, uh, scale crawlers. Um, phenologically speaking, these guys will hatch about eight weeks after full leaf expansion on red maple. That's about 1,500 growing degree days, give or take. And they have one generation per year, but they're active for a six to eight week period. So the first scale insect might hatch on the last week of May, and the last scale insect might hatch sometime in, in August. So again, that's where we talk about management strategies. That's where management can be challenging at some of these armored scales. Now, a very closely related cousin to the gloomy scale is obscure scale. These guys are almost identical when it comes to life cycle, how they feed, all that thing. The big distinction here is in their preferred host. So gloomy scale, loves red maple. If you're dealing with a commercial landscape and you have red maple, you probably have gloomy scale. Obscure scale loves oak species, specifically oak species in that red oak family. So if you're dealing with a commercial landscape and you have pin oaks, willow oaks, schumer oaks, nuttal oaks, uh, Texas oaks, uh, Texas red oak, you name it, um, you probably have obscure scale. Now, the difference here is in the coloring. So notice here, if we go back to our armored scale or our gloomy scale, they have this nice black test. So if you're walking up to a red maple that has should have gray bark and you see this black, good chance you're dealing with that gloomy scale. Obscure scale is grayer. So notice how gray that is. So from a distance, it's hard to spot this scale. Again, you would see, um, you could be seeing chlorosis in the tree, you could be seeing thinning in the tree, uh, but you really have to get up close and observe this obscure scale. It's difficult to diagnose from far away. Um, but as far as life cycle and treatment, um, it's gonna be very closely related to gloomy scale. Now again, noting that we have folks from all over the country on here, some other scale insects, armored scale insects that you'd be looking for in commercial landscapes throughout other parts of the country, one would be uh, pine needle scale. And this often affects a lot of our introduced pines. Um, so like Austrian pine, Japanese black pine, if you're dealing with those types of pines, Scots pine um, in your commercial landscapes, this is gonna be a big offender for you. And you can see the symptoms here, you get this kind of, um, you know, older needles begin to fall off, you get this chlorosis, you get this kind of browning. It can be, you know, often, you know, from a distance might be misidentified as a fungal uh, needle cast disease. Uh, but this is, is a distinction here. Uh, with our um, pine needle scale. Uh, and then the other one that we can run into very often in commercial landscapes throughout the country is this oyster shell scale. Um, again, oyster shell scale has a large host range um, of what it can affect as well. Um, but again, the exam oyster shell scale aptly named because the test looks like an oyster shell. Um, so pine needle scale has two generations a year um, and you can see the growing degree days there. Oyster shell scale has one generation per year. Um, so again, uh, other things to be keeping an eye on in um, if you're in other parts of the country.
Now, to segue over to management, it's always important to note that, you know, on a commercial landscape, especially, we could have a whole lot of things going on with a tree, right? Uh, and often we have several factors um, working on a plant, not just an insect. So things that we often find on commercial landscapes would be, again, you know, just incorrect planting practices. Uh, I don't know how many folks you guys have seen this, you know, trees planted and it still has the planting strap on it or the, um, you know, different kind of materials like this, this nylon strap, that's not going to go away. That can eventually girdle the tree and cause a lot of these symptoms as well. Uh, we have bark damage from people crashing into trees and things like that. Um, we have mulch volcanoes and we have plants that are planted too deep. So here we have no root flare. Uh, and then we deal with girdling roots. This is just a great girdling root that's going around the tree. So know that just because you have a tree that doesn't look well on your property, it could be a number of issues and scale insects is just one of them. So you always wanna make sure you're going through your, um, your appropriate response process of, of monitoring and diagnosing these issues on site uh, and then doing things to prevent them. Like so doing root collar activations, removing girdling roots, uh, all those types of things uh, before you narrow on on a, on a treatment protocol. Um, a few things that we mentioned here are, you know, we talked about when we are managing scale insects that we want to manage around that crawler period, if you recall. Um, so again, those crawlers are mobile. Uh, they're very delicate. When they begin to feed, it takes it doesn't take much to kill them. Um, so that's what we are always kind of basing our management protocols around is that crawler, um, that crawler emergence. And so there's some tools out there you can use. Um, you can simply Google things like scale insect pests. Uh, there's a lot of different um, kind of charts out there. So this is one from New Jersey that talks about different scale insects and their, um, their growing degree days, uh, when they'd be active from a crawler standpoint. Um, there are tools out there that you can use to help you find the growing degree days in your part of the country. So you can go to the National Phenology Network visualization tool um, just put in some, some metrics and then you can scroll into your part of the country, click and you can find out what growing degree day you are at. And of course, you know, with our diagnostic guides that we provide and our technical support, we can guide you as to, um, you know, what the ideal timing would be for treating these pests. So talking now again about how we would actually treat them. So you know, a lot of folks rely on sprays uh, and sprays work very well. Now with sprays though, we have to be super duper timed into that crawler phase because that test, that protection that that insect creates works very well to repel different products. So when we're using foliar sprays and we have a lot of options for a foliar spray, when we're using foliar sprays, uh, we need to make sure that we are dialed in really strongly to that crawler emergence. And you can see here, we have a host of active ingredients um, that work well. Things like horticultural oil and insecticidal soap. Um, we have insect growth regulators. And the way these work is when this product comes in contact with the crawler, um, it's a, it basically messes with its hormones and it does not allow it to molt. So it doesn't molt, it doesn't mature, can't make new scales, uh, and eventually that scale will end up dying. Uh, and then we have, um, are products like imidacloprid, dinotefrans, itec, and transtec, which can be sprayed very effectively on crawlers and manage these pests. Um, but of course, the issues with spraying in a commercial landscape is people like to park underneath trees, right? Um, they provide shade, people like parking underneath trees, and um, you know you can have issues like this, um, where, you know, we got some, in this case here, we got some overspray on this really nice BMW. Um, and so we want to avoid things like that, I would imagine, on our uh, landscapes. You don't have to make the, that explanation to the, um, the, the managers out there, or the, the site property people out there. Um, so that ties into using some systemic options. So again, we have systemic options that we can use. We can use um, Zytec 10% as a trunk injection option. Uh, we can also use Transtech Infusible as a trunk injection option. Um, but now keep in mind, if we're dealing with our soft scale insects, imidacloprid will work well. But if we're dealing with armored scale insects, imidacloprid is not going to work well. So Dynatefran would be our product of choice. Um, and of course, the advantages of using these are you're not putting anything into the environment. You're putting it directly into the tree. 
Uh, we have two pieces of injection equipment that work very well for this. We have a manual single port injection system. Um, when you're using Zytec 10% or Transtec infusible, for the most part, we're injecting very small volumes into the plant. We're looking at anywhere from one to two mils per inch diameter. So very small volume. So at any given injection site, you're looking and injecting anywhere from two to four mils. So even on large sites with a lot of trees, using this um, hand-powered system is very, very effective and very fast way to do things. Um, we also have our IQ infuser. So this is a battery-operated piece of equipment. So this doesn't use compressed air like other systems. Uh, this uses a variable action pump. And the advantage there is when you use compressed air CO2, you are pushing that product in at a given PSI. So you're, in a sense, you're punching product into the tree, which can cause bark damage and delimitation and things like that. Using this type of system, we're not punching, but pushing. So we are subtly pushing that product into the vascular system, getting it up to where it needs to be. So this is a very effective piece of equipment. Um, we could have a whole other conversation about how this is using the, the benefits of this, but this is a very effective piece of equipment, if, especially if you're using Zytec 10% or Transtec infusible. The other beauty here is that uh, with our injection equipment, we're not utilizing plugs. There's no need to use plugs with these products or this equipment. Uh, and just as an example here, this is um, the, the site injection on using this, the correct diameter drill bit for our equipment. Uh, if we look at this a year later, it has completely uh, sealed back up there. So again, you know, we can use trunk injection very effectively. Um, we're not putting products out into the environment. We're reducing uh, drift. Um, and again, the, the plants recover very well uh, and respond very well to the treatment. So uh, an option there. Um, as far as an idea of time, so using this IQ infuser, people are always worried about, oh man, this might take a lot of time. Um, so this is an example. This is using another product of ours called Mectinite. Well, we're injecting larger volumes into the plant. So with Mectinite, we might be injecting five mils per inch or um, you know, maybe a little bit um, around that kind of thing. Um, whereas the Zytec 10% or Transtec infusible, we're in injecting, again, that like one to two mils per inch diameter. So even injecting higher volumes on about a 10 inch tree, we're only at the tree for on average five minutes and 32 seconds. Um, so it can be very quick, quick to inject using the IQ infuser. Now we can also use soil applications of our products as well. And of course, soil applications are great because again, you're not worried about drift. Um, it's quick, it's easy to do. You can use a soil injection method using our HTI device, which um, meters out the product very accurately. So you're not wasting product on site and it's uh, pre-calibrated for you. Or you can do just a standard drench. Um, the downside here, of course, is this takes a little bit more time and a little bit more labor to do this. Um, but with Transtech, we can actually use our lower systemic bark spray method. Um, and this is a very effective way, surprisingly effective way of getting this product into the plant. So using the lower systemic bark spray method, what we're doing is we are making a solution in just a standard backpack sprayer, nothing fancy. We are applying the solution from the root flare, the base of the ground, up to about five feet on the trunk, spraying that entire circumference. Uh, we're only applying about um, one and a half to two ounces per inch diameter. And so this can be done very, very quickly. Um, the key distinctions here are, you know, we have a very low equipment cost. There's not a lot of training in this. You just get a backpack sprayer and you spray the base of the plant. If you are comparing the high rate of our soil application, comparing that to proper application using the bark spray application, we actually end up using 47% less product. So we're using less product getting similar results, and the application method is very, very fast. So as an example, if you are looking at a 10-inch diameter tree and you are spraying at 14 PSI, you can treat that entire tree in 15 to 20 seconds. So you're at that tree for 15 to 20 seconds, and then you're walking on to the next tree. So using the lower systemic bark spray method, especially on these commercial landscapes, 
very fast, very effective way to manage these trees. And so if we look at some data, this is gloomy scale. This is in Charlotte, North Carolina. If you look at the basal bark spray application versus the untreated control, you can see that we have, this is the number of live scale insects. So this is on about um, six inches of growth, if I recall correctly. On six inches of growth, we have 77 live scale insects on our untreated plant. We only have 14 on our systemic basal bark spray. Uh, you see we have even less with our soil application, but if you look at the statistics, st statistically speaking, these are statistically the same, but obviously statistically different than our untreated control. So using our basal bark spray application can be very, very effective and fast in managing both soft and armored scales on these landscapes. It's just another example. This is looking at pine needle scale, another armored scale insect. So you can see here um, our control treatments. So this is percent mortality. So eight and a half percent of our control uh, insects died. Over 90% of our treated insects died. Uh, on the flip side, this is number of live adults, 126 and a half live adults, um, no live adults with our trans tech treatments. So very effective, very fast. False oleander scale is one that we didn't discuss, but again, for those of you along the coast, you're probably all too familiar with false oleander scale on things like Southern Magnolia um, can be a huge aesthetic issue for our clients. Um, using TransTech on these plants can be very, very effective. So that leads us into next steps. So now that you, we know all that we'd ever wanna know about scale insects, how to treat for them and what plants they affect, it comes down to now, practically speaking, what would I do on a site? So I'm out here, I'm on my landscape, I'm an account manager, I'm looking for an enhancement service. I have a handful of trees that aren't looking good. Well, one is identify the trees on site. So if you have red maples on your commercial site, chances are you have or will have gloomy scale. If you have any of these oaks, pin oaks, willow oak, schumer oak, nuttall oak, chances are you will have um, obscure scale. If you have crepe myrtle in certain parts of the country, chances are you will or at some time will have crepe myrtle bark scale. So step one, do a site inspection, figure out what species you have. If you're in the Southeast, Mid-Atlantic, in Texas, if you have any of these species, chances are you're gonna have a scale insect problem if you don't already have a scale insect problem. So from there, then you wanna determine what is the best application method. Um, Sometimes maybe it's spraying if, if it's applicable. Um, but if it's not applicable for multiple reasons, then you have your trunk injection options, which again, we found are pretty um, easy to do, um, very, very time efficient. Or we could do our lower bark spray application, which again, is very, very effective and very, very fast. So we decide what trees we have, we decide what application method we're gonna do. Then we need to figure out exactly how many of those species we have and determine an average DVH. So most of the sites that I'm on have an average DVH of around 10 inches. Again, we're usually dealing with trees that are planted up against infrastructure. We're dealing with trees that are planted in restricted root space. So they're not gonna, you know, in this case here we have live oaks. These live oaks are probably not gonna get to be 100 feet tall and, and 40 inches in diameter because of where they're planted. They may, but probably not. Um, so we need to determine how many trees we have on that site, determine our average DVH, then we need to figure out what we want our profit margins to be. Um, so just as an example, our worst price for TransTech would run you about $332 a unit. Um, if we looked at that per inch, this is looking at the lower BART spray method using TransTech, your cost per inch is about $1.34. We can do this a couple of different ways. We can determine a markup price. So we can do just a standard markup. So in this case here, a four times markup. That gives us a per inch price of $5.35. So if I have, again, if I have X amount of trees on a site and on average, they are uh, 10 inches in diameter, then maybe I'm charging about $53 a tree, $54 a tree, make it easy. Um, in some cases, depending upon how you run your operation, this might be enough, but depending upon your operation, you might need to decide you need to add a labor charge in there. So in that case there, you just determine what your labor is per hour. You decide how many trees you can do in an hour and you just simply add that to your final price. So if you're doing you know, one to 20, in this case here, figure we can do 20 trees in an hour at a 
labor rate of $25 an hour. And that labor rate of 25 hours an hour is covering um, the salary of your technician, all your overhead costs, insurance, things like that. Add that to your price. Then you figure out what that's going to be totally. Then you can add that, and when you propose it, you can propose it as a per tree price. Um, now this is this is the this, this is the secret right here. People always ask. They say, "Hey, how do your clients sell so much plant health care?" This is the secret. I'm gonna let you all know. They simply propose it. That is how you sell plant health care. You bring it to your client. So, with that being said. Create a simple proposal language that you can recreate for your account managers or whoever your sales folks are. You know, in this case here, um, this was an example. You know, we have X amount of trees were recently identified with a pest known as Gloomy Scale. Gloomy Scale is a pest of maples, primarily in the eastern U.S. Left untreated, this pest often predisposes the tree to other insects, fun and fungi, which can weaken the tree and cause premature death. We recommend and propose the treatment of your trees with a lower bark spray. We know it's going to get excellent control. This is your per tree price. This is your total price. Would you like to proceed? So that would be your final step. And real quick, if we just go through a little, this is um, a case study. So this is a project that I worked on in a past life. Um, so I may not be remembering this correctly and the numbers might be a little bit off. Um, but in this case here, what we had is we were charged with managing the trees on this high-end gated uh, homeowners Association in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, there were football coaches that lived here. There were NBA players that lived here. This was a pretty nice community. Um, they had approximately 300 willow oaks on this site. And so we talked about willow oaks. They could have lacanium scale. Willow oaks could have obscure scale. These, in this case, had a high infestations of lacanium scale. And we figured out the DBH range. We did a tree inventory. We found the DBH range was about four inches to 12 inches. So what we did is instead of proposing going ahead and treating all of those 300 trees in one clip, we proposed out a three-year management plan. And in this three-year management plan, we decided we were going to treat certain sections of the community um, based upon, you know, again, we let them decide their priority, what areas they thought were high priority versus lower priority. We broke it out into a three-year management plan where we were basically doing about 100 trees per year. We priced on average each tree was 10 inches uh, as an average DBH. Again, you know, we had a large DBH range. We figured uh, we wanted to make sure we weren't going to lose money, so we aimed a little bit high on our average DBH. So we proposed our average DBH was 10 inches. So we decided that we gave them a per tree price of $40 per tree. So that's $4,000 per year. And when we broke it out, we were about $1,500 in product cost. Uh, we were about $600 in labor. And now again, so this is, we were charging a, a high hourly rate. We we're charging a premium hourly rate in this case. So, you know, I showed the example in that last of $25 an hour. We were charging much more than $25 an hour for this. Um, but so we were charging a premium hourly rate. Uh, the hourly rate um, included, um, or excuse me, that, that labor included our hourly rate for, you know, our technician. So we were paying his salary. Uh, we we're also, of course, paying all our overhead, insurance, uh, trucks, all that kind of stuff. So that that $600 in labor represents all of that. Um, and then at the end of the year, obviously, we had a um, $1,900 difference. So from a $4,000 job, we kept $1,900 of that. So a little over half of that went directly into profit. Um, so I don't know how that looks to you folks. Um, but in this case, with this community, we, we were happy with that profit. So to wrap up here, again, we have a lot of supporting material. Uh, we have gloomy scale and crate bar scale cell sheets. Um, we can create other cell sheets at your convenience. And with these cell sheets, um, we give the information about the pest and then we can put your logo on that cell sheet. So it looks like it's coming from you and you can hand that over to your clients to help them explain why you're proposing these treatments. Um, if you want some help with proposal language, we'd be happy to email you some proposal language as well. So you can, of course, email info at treecarescience.com or contact your local TM or arborologist. Um, and of course, know that we're, as always, we're always here to help you guys out. And so with that, Matt, if we have any questions, I'd be happy to uh, try to answer those now. All right, so we got one question in here so far. 
Um, are you seeing gloomy and obscure scale in the Midwest, specifically Ohio? So that's a great question. Um, I would suspect that we would see um, obscure scale in Ohio. And I say that only because I know we see it a lot in southeastern Pennsylvania. It's very similar climates. Um, gloomy scale, I, I'm, I'll get back to you on where that distribution is. I feel like um, there was a report of it in southern Ohio, but I will, um, I will confirm the distribution of gloomy scale. Um, and uh, if Matt, uh, as always, if you would um, grab that person's uh, information, be happy to, uh, to reach out to them um, within the next week or so. No problem. All right, next question is, there any opportunity for biocontrol in Gulf South regions? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so biocontrol in the Gulf South regions. So specifically with, um, with critical bark scale, um, and again, I'm not sure if this is um, like published and documented or if it's just kind of um, observed and being reported that way, but there are reports saying that um, native um, predators um, and even some introduced predators, so specifically like ladybird beetles, uh, things like, of course, like, you know, your ladybug, Chinese ladybug uh, or Asian ladybug, um, twice stab beetle, I think I just mentioned that. Um, a lot of these ladybird beetles are building up in populations on these trees affected by crepe myrtle bark scale and um, effectively managing it. Um, I know that again, that's uh, I'm not sure if that has actually been like published and documented, um, but certainly research scientists are talking about that and observing it. Uh, and anecdotally speaking, even here in North Carolina, um, we have uh, we've had several sites. Actually, that rainbow was getting ready to do research on. But when we came back out the following year to uh, tag and mark the trees, um, the population of those crepe myrtle bark scale had collapsed. And again, the assumption is we found a lot of native predators. Uh, feeding on those scales. So um, certainly with crepe myrtle bark scale as an example, um, you know, you might have a population that peaks and then is uh, collapses and controlled by uh, just, you know, what's out there in nature, predators out there in nature. Um, so that's a potential. Now, we have not seen that um, with some of these other scale insects that we, we mentioned. Um, like gloomy scale and obscure scale is probably the the two um, most you will find certainly you will find predators out there um, You'll find ladybugs and things like that feeding on them, but it doesn't seem as of Yet and again, these are these have been around for a long time. or bark scale has only been in the country since 2004 that we know whereas Gloomy scale and obscure scale are native pests. They're not introduced. They're native to the US um, We don't see that type of control in commercial landscapes with um, with native predators and things like that. All right, next question. Is it better to use insect growth regulators like talus or contact or tank mix for hard scale crawlers? Uh, so that's a great question. So I am a big fan of the insect growth regulators for scales. Uh, so that would be like talus or distance. Um, I, in my experience, so one is data, I think supports it work. They work very well. Um, my experience is that they work very well. And what I like about them, uh, and so right now the only ones that we have available to us are ones that are fully replied. So, you know, they actually have to come in contact with the insect. Uh, so that's the downside of using them. Um, but again, they work well. And because, so again, the downside is that to be fully replied. Uh, but the silver lining to that is they are thought of as being softer on beneficials. So, um, you know, you shouldn't have, you should not have, again, that I'm aware of in, in the papers and things that I've read, you shouldn't have any issues with like um, harming a lot of your beneficial insects or benign insects or pollinators. Um, so if you're gonna go with a foliar application method over a systemic method, I would, I would recommend the insect growth regulators. Um, you can use things like bifenthrin. You know, I showed that on the slide because people still use things like bifenthrin. Uh, which are super effective um, on the scale itself, on that crawler insect. And again, the distinction with the foliar applications, we're definitely shooting to get those active crawlers. Um, the downside of using like a, of a bifenthrin or a permethrin is of course, it's a generalist insecticide. So it's gonna, you know, kind of kill anything that it comes in contact with that day. 
Um, so, you know, you, you have the chance of hurting some of these beneficial insects. Uh, and then in extreme cases, too, you can actually incite things like spider mite outbreaks. So you might actually cause other issues with the, the bifenthrins and, and permethrins. I mean, again, if effectively speaking, that day they will definitely kill scale insects. Absolutely, if, if you get those crawlers. Uh, but there's just some more, there's more caveats to those applications. So my recommendation would be if you're going to go, if foliar application is going to be the, the way that works best for your operations, I would use one of those insect growth regulators. Um, I think you'd be really happy with it. All right, next question we got here. Uh, do scales live throughout the tree or do they have height limits, stem diameter limits? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, I don't know if I have like a, like a, a, again, a good reference for that. Um, but that being said, you know, certainly in these commercial landscapes, you can find um, like gloomy scale um, on red maples that are, you know, in that kind of 30 to 50 feet range um, all the way at the top of the tree. Um, I don't know about sampling for, um, uh, excuse me, on obscure scale. Um, again, because you, you will find, you know, very large, especially in some parts of the country, like very large pin oaks in commercial landscapes. Um, and you will definitely have obscure scale um, along the lower limbs and trunk. Um, but that, I don't know how tall they would get. I don't know if that would, it, that'd be an interesting thing to, to dig into some literature about and see if they have a height maximum. Now with lecanium scale, which is a soft scale insect which will affect oaks, um, I have found them at the top of very large willow oaks. So, you know, probably like, again, 30, 50, 60 feet in the air on those trees. Um, and that's, again, you know, in cases where we're climbing and pruning those trees, um, you can find them very, very high up in the tree um, on at least willow oak and at least in the greater Charlotte metro area. <laughs> Right. Next question. Uh, do you use a base of 50 for your growing degree days? And what other sites are available to find growing degree days for one's home area? The NPN has a base of 32 degrees. So you can, so I use the base, I do use the base of 50. On the NPN, you can choose between 32 and 50. Um, so I use, I always use 50. Um, I don't know why I use 50. It's just because that's uh, the, when I first learned about growing degree days, that's what that person was talking about all those years ago. So that's what I've always used. Um, but the MPN is the one I primarily use now um, just because it, I've used other ones in the past and um, I've had issues with the, the site being down or they don't get updated. Um, so the MPN one is my primary go-to for growing degree days. Um, I don't have any other suggestions on that right now. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, I guess uh, the MPA one takes maybe a little bit getting used to because there's definitely some little drop downs and things like that. Uh, it also defaults to the 30 year average. So you have to go and pick on um, daily accumulated average as well when it comes to um, growing degree day. So there's a little bit of a learning curve there, but um, that's the one I, I use most now. And next question is, uh, what is a good reference book on scales? Oh, that's a good question. Um, there are, there's a book, I can't remember when it was published, but I think it's called something like, you know, again, Scale Insects in the Landscape. It's old. Um, that's a good one. Um, you know, your standard um, Cornell Press, I'm looking at right now, the insects that feed on trees and shrubs is a great resource as well. Um, you know, again, making sure you have a, a current copy. Um, those are some of those are, those are some of those ones we, we turn to pretty often. Um, and then of course, you know, local extension, depending upon your local extension, um, some have really great um, entomologists. So you know, there's some folks down in Clemson University that are just really great entomologists that work on scale, same with North Carolina State, um, LSU, Texas A&M. Um, you have some really good entomologists that, um, work on scales in the landscape that will be really great resources as well. All right, uh, next question. Uh, what are your thoughts on neem oil or mineral oil? Oh, that's a good question. So I don't know, so I mean now, um, admittedly, I've not used a lot of neem oil. Um, what I 
know of it is that it would be also a good opportunity. Uh, it works very much. It also has like um, uh, insect growth regulator properties as well. Um, so again, I just, I'm not too fair terribly, I've never used it myself very much. Um, there's data out there to support it. Um, certainly be, you know, trying in a small example trial or something like that would probably be a good idea. Um, like mineral oil, um, like, you know, uh, things like horticultural, things like that. Those would also work, um, with all those things you would be targeting, you have to target that crawler. Uh, you target that crawler, you're going to um, be very successful. Uh, if you're using any of those other products and you're targeting the wrong life stage, you're probably not going to get the results that you're hoping for. Okay, and I think it looks like you inadvertently answered the next question, so we'll move on to the next. Uh, does imidacloprid harm hummingbirds? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't think it does. So does imidacloprid harm honeybirds or hummingbirds? I, I don't know. Um, I don't think so, but I don't know either. All right, and the next is, can scale outbreaks be affected by fertilizer management? Ooh, great question. So yes, the answer is, so the question again is, can, um, can scale insects be harmed by fertilizer application? Uh, so, and again, there's caveats to fertilizer application. If you are applying a fertilizer where you're looking at applying greater than three pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet, that's going to encourage a lot of succulent top growth. Um, and scale insects really like that succulent um, growth. So especially, um, well, I guess, but really soft and armored scale, I guess there's no especially there really. They both really like that succulent growth. So if you're encouraging copious amounts of succulent growth, um, you could actually be um, encouraging uh, scale populations. And it's like one of these weird insects where, you know, certainly if a plant's defenses have been lowered, the scale can take advantage of that. But, you know, in a sense, scales like healthy plants you know they're looking for they're getting nutrition from the plant so a healthy plant that's producing a lot of great photosynthate um, that scale is going to be happy so if you fertilize it you put on a lot of that succulent growth um, you're going to make that scale happy so proper fertilization um, certainly you don't need to um, completely um, omit a fertilization regime if you have scale insects but Taking soil sample, fertilizing appropriately, not over fertilizing would all be really important. Um, so yeah, over fertilization, incorrect fertilization can encourage scale insects for sure. Good question. All right, and we have done a little bit over, so thank you everyone for sticking with us. We got one more question and then we'll wrap this up. So last question is, how would you recommend making basal applications to smaller ornamental trees with lower branch structure? Uh, would a drench be a better option in those places? Oh, that's a great question. So, you know, I'm imagining like maybe you have a, like a southern magnolia and you have um, branches all the way down to the ground. Um, you could still do a, a bark spray application for sure. So uh, when you're doing a bark spray application, we, we covered on it just really briefly, but you're calibrating your sprayer. So you're applying um, one and a half to two ounces per inch diameter to that lower portion of the tree. So if you can get down into that area, um, you could still do a lower bark spray. However, caveats to that are generally we're going to recommend using a bark surfactant, which we didn't really cover over on either. Um, but the rates that you're, that bark surfactant you're using on can actually be um, phytotoxic. So um, so if you're using that bark spray application and you're using a bark penetrate like scrimmage, um, you could you could um, brown up some of those leaves. It doesn't kill the plant at all but you can cause, you know, like a burning effect to the leaves. So that'd be something to think about versus do I want to do a bark spray or do I want to do a soil drench? Um, and so the other part of that then, I mean, yeah, operationally efficiently wise, it might just be easier to do a soil drench on those um, just so that you're not trying to, you know, again, with a bark spray, you need to get full coverage. Um, so, you know, in a sense, you have to like move into the plant, back out of the plant, move into the bat plant, back out of the plant, whereas with a soil drench, maybe you just you get up underneath there, you dig your little trench and, you know, you pour your, your solution in. And or if you're using something like the HTI, um, again, that piece of equipment that would um, automatically um, calibrate your injections, you're just kind of getting in there and doing your quick injections and, and moving out. So 
Um, I guess it would come down to operational efficiency. I guess if you're asking me specifically, I'd probably do a bark, or excuse me, I'd probably do a, a trunk or a soil drench in those situations, uh, just because I think it probably would be easier. But but you could do a bark spray if if you were dying to. And that's all we have for questions. Awesome. Well, hey, I know we're over. Thanks everyone for hanging on. Looks like we only lost like two people. Um, really appreciate it. Um, check out our website for more information, for more webinars. Um, everybody have a great, healthy, happy rest of your week and day. Thank you all.